Welcome. Thank you for joining us here at AmazingLove.org. And, uh, you know, it's been a dream of mine to reach people all across the world with a message of Jesus and his love. And so whether you're joining us from near or far, so glad that you're here. And uh, we'd love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if he's blessed you by this ministry, please email us at impact at amazinglove at gmail.com. If you'd like to support this ministry and make sermons like this possible every week ongoing, please go to amazinglove.org and go to our giving tab. But now may God bless you. May he guide you, may he speak into your life and direct you all through the power of his love. Thank you. Dear friends gathered, I invite you to join in prayer with me. Let's ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, we have come hungry, and hungry not so much physically, but spiritually. And we're asking that you would satisfy us. Satisfy us with the bacon and the prime rib of your word. Do not leave us empty. Rather, Lord, your, your people have gathered, and, and, and fill them this day with your spirit. Fill them with the knowledge of your goodness. Let them see your power and your glory, which is on display at this place. Let us have the joy, then, of worshiping, of responding to your goodness, of responding to everything that you gave. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, for my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. So welcome once again to Amazing Love, and I uh, hope you're doing well. hope the Christmas tree is up and that the lights are lit, and uh, good to see everyone today. And I wanted to know, how many of you are um, savvy consumers? Savvy consumers. If you'd raise your hand if you think like, man, I just got the shopping thing down, right? And um, I know this is a place of humility, so I know there's people who's like, you know, I'm not going to raise my hand, but inwardly they don't even know. Like, uh, I just do that, right, you know? And uh, I think about the ways you can be a savvy consumer. One is by hunting. You can be a hunter. And uh, for me, this was uh, Black Friday. And uh, in Black Friday, if you've followed it for a while, you can get the ads early online. Uh, you can go and you can see where the ads are collected. And uh, I'm going to turn myself down a little bit just because I'm getting some feedback. Uh, so awesome. Cool. We're off to a good start here. Is that better? Can everyone hear me still? Everyone still with me? Can hear me? Don't hear that buzz. All right. Very good. Um, and, uh, and so maybe you were online, you know, Black Friday, and you got the ads before they even came out. Uh, maybe you're a negotiator, which is kind of a lost art, you know, that you can negotiate. You start, you know, at a place, and you know when to walk out because, you know, they're just not getting it. And, uh, you know, I, I think our culture teaches us to be savvy consumers. You know, we arm ourselves with flyers and coupons and groupons. And uh, has anyone heard of uh, this website, Retail Me Not? Uh, it's a gift, my gift to you today. Uh, <laughs> if it's online, you can just type the company in and get $10 off or 10% off, and it's awesome, right? And um, what is the essence of savvy consumerism? Well, if you break it down, what are you really trying to do? Well, I think I have the goal. Here it is in, in my mind. It's how can I get the most while paying the least? Right? How can I get the high-quality coffee maker, you know, but if uh, Kohl's has it cheaper and it's always on sale at Kohl's, you know, I'm going to go to Kohl's, right? How can I get the most while paying the least? And our culture has so taught us how to do this, we even have a colloquial phrase for this. And see if you can fill in the blanks. How can I get the biggest bang for the... Very good. The biggest bang for the buck. And uh, see, see, you know what this is. And, and I would just promote to you, be a savvy consumer. Do that. You know, be nice to business owners and especially the employees. But uh, if some ha place has it cheaper, you know, uh, go, go get that. Um, well, I wanted to talk about spiritual things today. And uh, that's why we gathered, right? And I guess my question is, how much of a consumeristic lens creeps into our view of the church? How much of a consumeristic lens even creeps into your view of God? And, and let's consider it this way. Maybe an example would be like, how, how little can I give to God before he answers my request? 
You know, some have considered God maybe like a personal genie. You know, and, and if I just, do I have to rub three times? Is it three prayers before you're going to give me and answer me? And, you know, what can I do? Or, you know, another pastor called this view of God as kind of a cosmic Coke machine. You know, I put in, you know, just the, the right things, and hopefully, you know, it's not too much, and, and he'll pump out what I want, right? You know, because that's why we've come to God. You know, just pump that out. Or I consider how much of it might creep into this discussion in the church. And uh, welcome, by the way, if you're not a church person, we're so glad you're here. Um, but if you're a church person, I bet at one time or another you've asked this question or you've said this. Are you ready for it? That coming to Sunday or a sermon or a Bible class, you said, I didn't get much out of that. Whatever that was, you know what I'm saying? And I only bring it up because I've done it, right, you know? And I understand the frustration even. You know, I understand the frustration of really wanting to get something and like, you know, uh, you know I didn't understand or, or whatnot. And, and I want you to know it is the church's job to go forward with clarity, to bring our best when proclaiming this message. But if you only ask, what can I get? If you're only saying, I didn't get much, I think it's a short-sighted view of worship. And I think this Christmas, there's a way for a pure, higher form of worship. That's, that's what I want to talk to you about today. So you ready? All right, all right, we're going we're gonna to get into it. Uh, we're, we're in a, a new series called Come to Worship. And we've seen from Matthew that the, the Magi, they came to worship. And, uh, and they're still our models for what it is to worship God. And they didn't ask, what could I get? Rather, they were driven by a completely different question, which we'll talk about. Uh, but as we talk about the Magi here with me, I want to go over just a few misconceptions about the Magi. A few misconceptions, just to unearth this. And it has to do with that song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. We Three Kings of Orient Are. You're welcome for my singing, anyway. Um, but, uh... Nervous, but you're still in so good. Uh, anyway, um, first of all, the problem is we don't know if there are three. Um, there are three gifts. They brought gold, they brought frankincense and myrrh, but we don't know if there were three. It just says there were more than one. There were magi. Next, we don't know if there were kings. They, they, they think that they were kings because of the rich things that they brought, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh, but presumably they were not kings. Next, orient. Orient is usually a reference to Asia, to Japan, to eastern parts of that. And we know they're most likely from modern-day Iraq, um, between the Mesopotamia, um, old Babylon. And so, basically, this song is an epic fail. Just want you to know. <laughs> Sorry, writer. The next thing I want to do is disrupt your Christmas decorating by talking about these lovely things. The nativity set. Anyone got a nativity set? You might not want to raise your hand on this one because I'm going to unearth it. It's beautiful. It's a children's set, and they've uh, got the kings, you know. We don't know if they're kings. And uh, look at where and when they come. No, obviously, they're still in the barn, right? Uh, because uh, Jesus is in the manger filled with hay. And, and that's cute, and that's lovely, but um, look back at the first lesson. First lesson, uh, Matthew, ch verse 11, it says, On coming to the house. I don't know about you, but house is not a manger. House is not a stable. House is a house. And so they were not there. They did not make it for the birth of Jesus. I don't know if you know that. They weren't there. And so I think, you know, what we could do to kind of freshen up this idea of nativity is, you know, elf on the shelf and, you know, whatever they are. And so you can do that with the Magi. You take these little guys, you put them in, like, the kids' room and the bathroom, and you just tell people they're on their way, right? Um, so you're welcome. And... Maybe I can, you know, like, consumeristic magi on the mirror, you know, so I'm, we're going to start our own thing, and we're just the, the new fad, right? But while there are many misconceptions over the magi, what is common, what is, what is known, what, what is unmissable, is why they came. They came to worship, and they're leaders in what worship was. And they didn't really ask, what can I get? They didn't really ask, what is, what is Jesus going to give me at this point? Um, I was doing more research, and they think that Jesus may have been about one or two years old right now. Now, um, any of you ever had a, a two-year-old? Maybe some of you have them now. How worship-worthy are two-year-olds? Like, a two-year-old can barely talk well. A two-year-old doesn't walk very well. It's very wobbly, you know. A two-year-old, let's face they don't control themselves, right, you know. Um, you know, so, so you look at the Magi worshiping two-year-old Jesus, right? Like, he's not going to astound them with his teaching. <laughs> he can't talk so well according to his humanity. 
You consider toddler Jesus, and he's not going to do any miracles. Maybe the most miraculous thing is that he doesn't throw his mashed potatoes when he's eating mashed potatoes. You know, it's, it's interesting to try to think about a sinless toddler. I don't have that experience. I don't know about you. And so if they asked from Jesus, what can I get, they would be left very, very wanting. But they didn't ask, what can I get, did they? They asked a completely different question. And they gave us the true heart of worship. For this is what they asked. What can I give? What can I bring? Because this is the King of kings, and this is the Lord of lords. This is the Savior of the world, and I just want to be in his presence. So what could I bring that would be worthy of a king? And that's how they wanted to worship God. And this is what I'm hoping God would work in you, this spirit that responds to a king and asks the question, what can I bring to someone who is so great and so glorious? So let's get into the word of God. And uh, we're going to have in this series not only the story of the Magi, but Psalms interwoven with this. And the Psalms are a great place because the Psalms are all about worship. Today is a Psalm from David, and I invite you to follow along with me in uh, Psalm 63 we're going to talk about and discuss. Psalm 63 says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and I beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied with the richest of food. And, and there it was interesting translating this week because it was really a reference to fat. <laughs> I will be satisfied with the fat that you bring. And it reminds me of like bacon. <laughs> And it reminds me of like prime rib, right? You know, so when it comes to God, he's the bacon giving. He's the prime rib giving God who satisfies. Um, because you satisfy me with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I will remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I will sing in the shadow of your wings. Now, I don't know how this language struck you. But when I was considering how David talks about God, it's very intimate language. When David talks about God, he's not talking about God as if God were an enemy. He's not talking about God as if he was a stranger. Rather, this language is so intimate, it is clear that when it comes to David, God is, man, he's a friend. He is close. He is the BFF. He is the bestie. He is that close to David, and, and that is what God is. And I think our view of God will affect our worship. I'm not sure how you came in today viewing God. But if you view God as your stranger, I'm not sure how well your worship will be. If you view God as some spiteful, vengeful enemy just waiting to strike you down, I'm not sure you'd even want to be in his presence. But if you view God as a friend, as someone who is so near and dear to you, you might just erupt in praise. You might just ask, what can I give to this friend? And that's the heart of worship. So let's discuss what, what God has for us here. And may God bless that discussion. Um, I'm always interested at how much we follow celebrities, if that makes sense. Our culture loves to follow celebrities. And, and there is something in us that just, that just craves to be around those who are famous. It craves to be around those who do wonderful things, whether they're sports athletes who can dunk, whether they're actors who have just wowed us with their performance, or, or songs that we're singing. And, um, and maybe for you, there, there is someone that, uh, if you could meet a celebrity, you knew who you'd meet, and you'd know who you'd want to line up for. Um, in fact, just to get you going, could you just tell someone next to you if there's someone famous you'd like to meet? Uh, tell them who that would be, someone famous, a uh, celebrity you'd like to meet. Just, this is the interaction portion of today. Um, who would you like to meet? Who would you like to meet, celebrity? <clears throat> all right, all right. I don't think I heard Bieber. But I'd like to meet Bieber. Um, I'm kind of an odd duck. I'm kind of an odd duck in the sense that the, the big names for me, and this is so strange, you'd be like, this dude is weird. The big names for me are actually pastors. 
Is that, isn't that weird? And uh, I remember uh, one time having a book in my hands. I was there for a book signing. I was going to meet this guy who I highly esteemed. You know, I was just super excited. And I remember the emotions of what that's like. Like, my heart was just like, I could feel it, right? You know, and I was standing in line. I was hoping don't look like a fool, right? You know, and I was so, like, nervous that I could, like, run in circles, you know, because I had so much nervous energy. Um, and, and, and I remember, you know, having the opportunity then to be in this person's presence and just being like, wow, this guy's great. This is awesome. Sometimes, though, the problem with meeting those who we put on a pedestal is that they let us down, though. And you don't have to respond if that's ever happened to you. Sometimes you, you find those that we've so propped up actually let us down because they weren't that great. And you saw a flaw, and, and they left you kind of wanting. Well, whoever it is that you have on that pedestal, whoever it is that you just were super-duper excited to meet, this is how David views God. It is. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 again says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I'd wait in lines to be in your presence. I thirst for you. That's intimate language. And it says, My whole being longs for you. Now, translating there from the Hebrew, it was this idea that you would even faint for longing around him. And it reminds me kind of like a teenage girl who would be around like some rock star, you know. And, and so David is so like about God that he's like, I'm going to faint for longing for you. And what I see God saying to us is this, that if you know what it is to praise a celebrity and be really pumped up, what God is saying to you is this, give God celebrity status. Let him be that one that you esteem. Let him be the one that gets the glory. Prop him up on a pedestal. I think maybe even the reason we, we like celebrities is because maybe it draws us to our natural inclination to want something that is great, to want something that is glorious, and we find it in God. The question then is, where could we go to be in his presence? Where could we go to meet him? Um, if he is so great and, and if he's not going to let us down, where can we go to be in the presence of the celebrity? Now, if you go back to the word, the Magi, they followed a star, and the star led them to Bethlehem. If you look at verse 2, this is where David found him. Verse 2 says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. The sanctuary. For David at the time, it was in Jerusalem. And there they were worshiping God in the tabernacle, which was a tent. And, and David knew what it was to be in that place and to see glory and power on display. He knew how good it was. Now for us, where can we go to be in the presence of God? You're in the right place, right? <laughs> See, that's why church is so good. That's why if you're just visiting today and you're wondering, like, why do my Christian friends always give up their Sunday mornings? Because this place is pretty awesome. Because I don't know about you, but I've had opportunities to behold the power and the glory of God, and so it's great to see you. <laughs> There's no better place I'd want to be, and I hope your best emotions are in this place because we get to behold him here. You know, I was reminded of the, the power and glory that goes on here uh, through a discussion with my wife. My wife is an avid Facebook user, and she gave me permission to tell this story, by the way. But um, uh, she had this thing that uh, it, it goes back like seven years ago, this is what you posted. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, sometimes it just pop up, this is what you were doing and saying seven years ago. And, and, and it was this post where around Thanksgiving, she went all by herself to a worship service. And this was so critical because our children were young and, uh, and she had been bearing the brunt of that, you know, because I was preaching. And so it was so critical for her to be by herself and worship God. And she remembers and she told me uh, what it was just to, to cry at singing of hymns and to be so emotional just to hear the word of God again and to have that comfort and to be in that place and that power that was on display. I have a similar experience I can remember clear as day, as a young man, I was just one day just really, really hurting, really, really down and out. And I remember that morning um, going early to church. And I remember there crying. And I remember God changing the essence of my tears. I remember I came in with fear, but he did bring peace. I remember came in hurting, but he did bring comfort. And it wasn't because it was a perfect church. It wasn't because it was a perfect pastor or the people around. It was just that God's glory and his power were on display. 
You know, we see that today. We should always marvel at a baptism, the baptism today of James Bowen, because his glory and his power will be on display as he takes plain water and he makes James a child of God, as the Spirit works in him to make him a new creation through the rebirth and renewal of these waters. This is awesome. And because this is what David experienced, this is what he longed for. And back to David's life, when he wrote this, he was hurting. If you open your Bibles to Psalm 63, it says that David was in the desert of Judah. Now let me explain his story at this point. Being in the desert of Judah gave us two options for his life. He was either running away from his father-in-law, Saul. Saul was king and wanted to kill him. Or he was running away from his son, Absalom, who also wanted to kill him. And you thought your family was tough. This is bad for David. This is hard for David. And David knows if I could only go to the temple, if I could only be surrounded by the people, if I could only be in the presence of God, there I would have help. That's my experience. And so I'm telling you, if you're hurting at all, because the holidays bring hurt, there are stressors on our time, our finances, and our emotions. If you're hurting at all, you're in the right place. Because God has a way of helping. That's been my experience, my wife's experience, David's experience. I hope you walk away today helped because you saw the power and the glory of God on display. That's what happens here. That's why it's good to be here at Christmas. But because of all that David experienced through God, he goes on with a wonderful verse 3. Look at verse 3. And then he says, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Now, this could be a life verse. This, this could change your paradigm. This, this is an awesome verse that I wanted to talk to you about. Because your love is better than life. Now, for me, it was hard to compare the value of my life to love. So I, can, I considered the things of my life to God's love. And uh, so I did a little bit of pastor's favorite things and how God's love was better. And among pastor's favorite things, you know, um, are, are bacon and donuts. Um, but also I got a new favorite. I, I brought it with you. I want to show you. Um, we did some Black Friday shopping, and uh, my wife actually picked it out. It's, uh, it's a new comforter. And um, I used Retail Me Not to get uh, $20 off of this new comforter, and um, it is the softest thing ever. In fact, if you want to have an experiential sermon today, you know, afterwards you can come up and, oh, it's great, you know. <laughs> and I don't know what kind of consumer you are, but I'm the type of consumer that reads the reviews. Because they're not going to get me with a low-quality uh, door buster, my friends. They're not going to get me. No. So I'm going to read the reviews, and this got a 4.9 out of 5-star rating. That's a good deal. And people were going off. They're like, this is like what, it's, what it is to be wrapped up in a marshmallow. And I'm not sure how they knew that, you know, but anyway, it sounded good. And, uh, and this is the softest thing ever, and, and it's on and on and on. But I did find a bad review. And a bad review said that sometimes the threading gives out. The threading gives out, and I, I see a little bit of the threading here. And so what I find is that this is really soft. And it's awesome. But even the best product, even the, the finest thing that I have from J.C. Penney's, it has a problem. Even the finest things that you have. Maybe for you it's not a comforter. Maybe for you it's a rifle because you're a hunter. Maybe for you it's a kitchen appliance. Maybe for you it's some clothes. Even the finest things do not retain a five-star rating. The finest things will fail us. Children, you need to know that about toys. If you're going to get that hoverboard, it might just fail you. I'm sorry. And adults, we know this about people. People, as good as they are, will fail us. I will fail you. Our, our husbands and our wives will fail us. Our kids will fail us. Bosses will fail us. In fact, I read scripture and it says that we are not five-star rated. That we too are imperfect products because of our sin. And maybe you were struck by that in the introduction. Maybe when I was talking about the introduction, you felt like, man, I, I often am short-sighted. I often am self-centered. I often am just in it for me, and I don't always care about bringing, and I don't always care about giving. This is evidence of sin. And because we don't have a five-star rating, God should say, I'm done with you. Your threading gave out long time ago. But he doesn't do that. 
and that's not why we're here. See, the story of Christmas, they say five-star product or not, I'm going to come to save you. I'm going to save you through a perfect product, a perfect thing that the Magi were so excited to see, even as a toddler, a perfect thing that was born of a virgin in a town called Bethlehem, a perfect thing who would be the Savior of the world, and his name is Jesus. And maybe our longing for perfect products that don't fail us, maybe that was all just pointing us to a far grander thing, far grander source, which is Jesus, our Savior. And so back to what David said. He said, your love is better than life or the things of your life. And, and that Hebrew word of love was this word. It was chesed. And you got to do that because Hebrew is a guttural language. You kind of spit when you say it. Chesed. And so you want to say that with me? Here we go. Chesed. Which means faithful love. Which means God doesn't fail you. Which means even when Jesus was tempted to have the threading give out on his way to the cross, he said, no, my Father's will be done, and no, I have joy on the other side of that. That joy is these people gathered at Amazing Love, these people who I want to know my love and my power. I'm not going to fail them here. And so let all your hopes for a perfect product be met in him. He's worthy. May you respond and worship to this perfect thing who's so much better than a polyester Sherpa blanket. And so let's talk about responding. Because that's what David now says. After viewing God, after knowing what he has, he said in verse 4, And so I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Lift up my hands. Now, I, I have a Lutheran background. I don't know if you do. Uh, but lifting up your hands in worship kind of makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and uh, I remember being in a worship service where they like prompted me to lift up my hands and they're basically like, you're sinning if you don't lift up your hands and, and I still didn't do it because I was uncomfortable. Um, I need to loosen up a little bit though because obviously this is an appropriate way to praise. And uh, so lifting up of your hands, it can go on in here, that's all right. Just as it can go on that, that you might do this, just as it might go on that you do this. Uh, when it comes to the actual forms of worship, you need to know there is liberty. There is liberty. So if someone next to you is doing this and you're doing this, it's all right. If someone next to you is doing this, awesome. Because you might know this about worship. God is way less concerned about what goes on outside and way more concerned about what goes on inside. And so when we talk about responding by lifting up our hands, I think let's not talk about it literally, but, but maybe a different way. What, what could we do to respond and give? I, I'm not so concerned about the literal lifting of hands, but, but let's talk about it this way. I want to show you a picture and uh, to get you thinking about how you might respond. And uh, it's a picture of this lady. Now, some of you might have kids. This is my Nadia. Nadia also goes by the fond name of Noodle. Call her Noodle. And uh, one of my favorite things is just to call her, that's my girl. My girl, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, my girl, I don't say that in like a weird possessive way, right? That's weird. Um, I say it in an affectionate way. This is my girl. This is, this is the one I'm proud about. This is the one that, that like love doesn't just capture the essence of, of what I'm truly meaning. Or, or take this young lady. This is Bella. I also call her Bomb Bomb. Why? I don't know but I also call her my girl, my girl, because love isn't just enough. I'm, I'm proud of this one. So thankful that she's in my life. This, this is my girl. What is your opportunity to do this Christmas? It's to look at these kids and to look at those people that we have affection for and say that about God say when it comes to Jesus my Savior, the one who rescued me, that's my God. <laughs> that's him. That's my Lord. That's my Savior. That's, that's my Jesus. There's no one better. And love just doesn't do it justice. That's, that's my God. That's where David was. David said in verse 1, you God are what? <laughs> You're my God. And so what might lifting up our hands be? I think maybe it's lifting up our voices. 
and declaring that God, that, <laughs> that's my God. That's the one who, when I was lost and lone, that's the one who when I was hurting said, I love this one too much to not do anything. I love this one too much and so I'm coming to get him. Because as we call him my God, he calls us my child. This is the true heart of worship. So may you respond. May you say not just that he saved you, but, but speak about the things that he continues to do in your life. Speak about the glory and the power that you continue to see as I continue to see, as he continues to show up. And respond asking, what can I give? And respond saying, this is my God. You know, at the beginning of this sermon, I set up really a false dichotomy of what can I get versus what can I give. And the reality is worship is both. <laughs> the reality is that David experienced so much from the Lord that he wanted to give. And the Magi, I believe, already knew about the Savior. That's why they wanted to worship. And so let me refine my definition of worship. It's what can I give in response to what he gave. Because he gave five stars. He gave this for me. What can I do to respond? May God so guide you and bless you. May that be your heart. And may God bless you and have a merry Christmas. Amen.